Our next reader is Emma Eisenberg. Emma Eisenberg's work has appeared or is forthcoming soon in places like Granta, the Los Angeles Review of Books, American Short Fiction, Electric Literature, Recommended Reading, Catapult, The Rumpus, The New Republic, The Marshall Project, Salon, Slate, Spencer, 100 Days in Appalachia, and more. She is the recipient of honors and fellowships from the Tin House Summer Workshop, Aspen Summer Words, Narrative, Lamba Literary, BuzzFeed, the Virginia Center for the Creative Arts, the Turkeyland Co. Foundation, the Martha Vineyards Institute for Creative Writing, and the Robert Rauschenberg Foundation. Her first book, The Third Rainbow Girl, is forthcoming from Hatchet Books. So please welcome Emma Eisenberg. On a clear night and moving at average speed, it would take an ambulance 40 minutes to cover the 16 country miles between Pocahontas Memorial Hospital and Briary Knob Road, where Vicki and Nancy were found. The ambulance was spotted leaving the hospital, wailing through the hamlets of Buckeye, Mill Point, Hillsborough, and Drew Mountain. By the next morning, word had covered the southern part of Pocahontas County like a fog and was moving north towards Marlington, the county seat. Wives called their husbands at work, children talked on the school bus and told their parents over dinner, in the bar and restaurant at the Marlington Motor Inn, at Miss Kitty's Beer Joint, at Dory's Lunch Counter, in the front yard of the Hillsborough Presbyterian Church after services, at the logging, um, after services, as the logging trucks wheezed down Route 219, people told other people that two girls from somewhere else had been found dead. What a shame, what a waste. Not only was it a tragedy for their families, but it was also a tragedy for the county, an embarrassment, people said, another reason for the world to point at West Virginia and shudder. June 25th, 1980 was a Wednesday. Um, McNeil is the local editor of the paper, I should have said that. McNeil published on Wednesday mornings, so the news of Bob's discovery in the woods didn't hit kitchen tables and diners or the dispensers in Foodland until a full week later, July 3rd. Quote, tragedy struck the county with the finding last Wednesday of the bodies of two young women on the Briary Knob Road, he wrote. The paper ran two thumb-sized photos of the women, but their identities remained unknown. Pocahontas County Sheriff's deputies showed photos of the dead women around the Rainbow Gathering, but no one seemed to know them. A few days later, McNeil got the first call. I saw the article about the dead girls, a woman said, into the New York State end of the line, and I think one of them might be my sister. Kathy Centimero, that's the sister, had made the trek to the gathering from Long Island to meet her sister Nancy, but Nancy never showed. A week after Kathy got back to Long Island, Nancy had still not called. <coughs> A friend of Kathy's who'd gone with her to the gathering did instead. He had taken a copy of the Pocahontas Times on his way out. He kept looking at the two small pictures of the dead women. One of them looked familiar. Was it Nancy? Kathy borrowed a car and drove to Charleston in early July, where the bodies were being stored in the care of the coroner. From the woven bracelets she had given her sister on the arm of one of the women she knew. The other body was quickly identified as Vicki Durian of Wellman, Iowa. And more yet, Nancy and Vicky had not been traveling as a duo, the sister told police. It had been a trio. It seems now that a third girl may be involved, reported McNeil. She is believed to be a tall, slender blonde named Elizabeth. End quote. It stood to reason that if three women had traveled together and two had ended up dead, the third should be dead too, or in mortal danger. For two days, sheriff's deputies in West Virginia and Iowa searched for the elusive Liz. Authorities in every American state were sent her description area around Briary Knob where Bob had found Vicky and Nancy was checked and rechecked. Elizabeth Jondro, Liz. At 52, she has long white blonde hair and fit arms, toned and leather browned from shaping bricks in the South American sun, and before that, from building straw bale houses in Idaho. But she was not always this way. Liz grew up the daughter of a school teacher. She was an honor student, but at night and on the weekends, she and a friend got the hell out of suburban Connecticut. They hitchhiked. They hitchhiked to Vermont and to music festivals all along the East Coast. She didn't like where she lived. Her home life was not good. Her dad drank. Hitchhiking was free magic. You got in a car near where you lived and you got out somewhere better. When Liz turned 17, she dropped out of high school and took off west. She ended up in Tucson, Arizona, with nothing but a backpack. She was loitering outside the Organic Foods Co-op when she met Vicki Durian, a nurse who everyone called Bright Star. Durian is an old farming name in Wellman, Iowa, a square half-hour drive due south and then due west from Iowa City. Vicky's family often made the local weekly, the Kelowna Daily News. They bore pals, they cheered the Board of Education, they hosted the wedding receptions of friends at the Veterans Hall. Vicky's mother taught, then married and raised eight kids, six boys, Vicky and her sister. 
The Mid Prairie High School class of 1972 is full of girls with long natural hair and cat eye glasses smiling at the cameras. But Vicky's dark hair is full and bobbed and parted to the side, clearly styled. She gazes off to the right of the camera. Vicky stuck around Iowa a long time, longer than most who grow up to be searchers. Each day of that next year after graduation, she made the hour and a half drive from Wellman to Scott Community College in Davenport. But five years out of high school, she couldn't stick around any longer. She lived other places before ending up in Tucson, but by 1980, there she was. By day, she worked as a licensed practical nurse, but by night, she went to parties at a sprawling communal house. Vicki took Liz there. It was a real hippie household, drumming, incense, people always passing through. But after two months of hanging out with Vicki, Liz took off again, ending up at a commune outside Tucson where several families from Arkansas who had been caught growing pot were hiding out from the law. Liz had just turned 18 and had finally found something that shocked her. They told her about the rainbow gathering. It would happen in a few months, that June, they said, in a patch of forest land where West Virginia touches Virginia. It was beautiful there, they said, they had heard one of the most beautiful places on earth. While Liz was gone, Vicki took in Nancy Santomero the same way she'd met Liz, by pure chance, on a clear desert day when they were both off work and putting around downtown Tucson. They shared the same sign, Taurus. Nancy had been staying with a friend in the University of Arizona dorms and working as a waitress at Dunkin' Donuts. Oh no, Vicki said, you can't do that. She took Nancy home to her apartment, then eventually arranged for Nancy to get a room at the communal house. I live in a nice large house with 10 other humans, Nancy's letters from this time show. Quote, four men, three women, three children, crazy crew. We always have travelers staying here with us, end quote. Vicki and Nancy may have gone on other adventures together prior to the rainbow gathering. <coughs> Traveling with a beautiful lady named Bright Star, Nancy wrote home, learning an awful lot from her. Nancy was 19 and buck-toothed and had never hitchhiked before. She grew up in a development that sat in the shadow of a strip of Long Island factories. She had worn foam sport sandals all her life and her hair in two braids and talked about becoming a park ranger. After high school, Nancy rolled upstate to SUNY Buffalo, but it was cold and she didn't like her roommate. The only thing she liked to do was drink. My nerves are acting up, she wrote home to her sister. Can't eat, can't sleep. I always thought myself to be a calm person. Tricked again. She dropped out, spent that winter meeting her high school friends in bars, and telling them how she had dreams, things to do, but she didn't know what they were or where. One of her sister's friends was studying at the University of Arizona in Tucson. It's warm here, she wrote to Nancy. The trio made plans to meet up in Iowa in early June. Vicky's sister had a new baby. For a week, Vicky, Nancy, and Liz ate ham, pork, and bacon and helped Vicky's sister. The baby howled. Vicky's parents wanted her to stop all this wandering and come back to live in Iowa after the gathering. Vicky said she would think about it. It was Vicky who would lean over and make people stop with the brightness of her smile and Vicky who would talk to them about who they were and where they were headed and why didn't they take this trio of women with them. There was the woman who drove past them because she was scared to pick up three hitchhikers and then turned around and came back because they were women and she felt she should. They got a ride in an RV from a woman who told them, send me a postcard when you get where you're going. Did they? Liz can't remember. Probably not, she says, since Vicky had the address. There was a truck driver who let them off at a truck stop in Illinois and told them about a baseball field nearby where they could get a safe night's sleep. They had a tent, but they never used it. So clear was the sky all those nights. Interstate stars. Vicki had brought a small drum in a velvet case, and she played it if she couldn't sleep. There was a Christian guy who took them home for dinner. They had a gun pulled on them. The driver told them he just wanted them to know he had it. He put the gun away and drove on. In Louisville, the driver was grabbing at Vicky, who was sitting in the middle. Somehow they got the driver to pull over, and Vicky nabbed his deodorant can and sprayed him in the face. They hopped out and ran. They were still on an adventure. In quiet moments, waiting moments, Vicky taught Liz how to juggle. The three women reached Charleston, West Virginia, ahead of schedule, thanks to Vicky's charms, Liz's savvy, and Nancy's nothing. They swam off the coast of Sullivan's Island, South Carolina, and camped on the beach. Back on the mainland, an empty trailways bus pulled over on the road's shoulder. Road's shoulder. The he talked to the guy as he drove up to North Carolina. Nancy dozed, but Liz couldn't. It was still raining. Liz watched the trees flick by. Something began to gnaw, something bothered. I had a very strong feeling, Liz tells me. It seemed to be like some dread and uncertainty. 
premonition or gut feeling. I don't think I know the difference, even though maybe I should, she says. I just had a very strong feeling that led me away from continuing traveling with them. At a rest stop, Liz called home. Her mother told her that her father was getting remarried that very weekend in Vermont. Oh yeah? Three women in a field just below Interstate 95 near Rocky Mount, North Carolina. Cotton, long haul trucks, alfalfa. They were saying, you know, why are you not coming, Liz says. We've been traveling all this time. So Liz lied. My father's wedding, she told them. In truth, her father was a drunk she cared for, not at all. The last ride they took as a trio was up 95 with a commuter who dropped them at a truck stop diner outside Richmond, Virginia. They had no money, loose change maybe. I remember it was morning, Liz testified at the first trial in 1993. People were in there having breakfast. This person bought us coffee and we were just kind of saying our goodbyes and making plans for Vicky and Nancy to come up to Vermont after the gathering. And then we walked out to the road. I was on one side, they were on the other. We were headed in different directions. Vicki and Nancy waited until Liz got a ride. Now she was a woman, hitchhiking alone. Be careful, Vicki called as Liz pulled herself up into the giant cab of a long haul truck. When Liz looked back, they were still there.